prayer this morning, that we stand surrendered. All we have is yours. We give ourselves completely to you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thank you so much, worship team. That was, that was excellent. Sorry, that's my favorite jam. And hey, happy 31st birthday, buddy. Good deal. So, hey. Yeah, we can back. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, thanks so much for all that you do. We do. We truly appreciate it. Wives, thank you so much for all that we do. Uh, and and I, think it's, I think it's interesting that, we, that stores are allowed to sell shirts that say, I have the best mom ever. World's greatest mom. Like, that's, that's not logically possible. But nevertheless, um, if they sold the shirt that was a large tall and said, best wife ever, I would buy that. Maybe I'm going to have to make one of those. I'm going to have to talk to Kayla. Uh, but we, we, we appreciate all that you do, moms. And so our children from a young age proclaim boldly and actually fight. I have the best mom ever. My mom's better than your mom. And so it goes. And we are so proud of all that you do. One of the most important things that you do is that you share your faith with your children. That you share your faith, the testimony of your faith. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, I thank God, Paul writing, uh, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, praying for Timothy. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Timothy, a young preacher, his sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. What a testimony of faithful, Christ-honoring parenting. A testimony to the word. Where the grandma loves Christ, the mom loves Christ, and the child loves Christ. Isn't that the best compliment we can give our mothers this morning, our faith? The best compliment we can give to our moms this morning is our faith. The, to, to show them that what they taught us, what they modeled for us, is reciprocated in our lives. I, as a parent, I'm proud of my children for the many things that they do. Their education, the, the, the books they read for their AR points, the, the, the sports they play, the, the way they're friends. But the thing that I'm the most proud of, and I think it would be the same for you, Godly mothers, the thing that I'm the most proud about for my children is their testimony that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Amen? I mean, I mean we, we look at all the things that our kids accomplish, our children accomplish, and, and it's, it's good. But the best thing that they have done, the best thing that they have, they have come to terms with is their faith. That they've wrestled with who Jesus is. And they've made that decision to believe in him, to confess him as Lord of their life, to repent, and to be baptized. And that encourages my heart. That blesses my heart. And I think, I think speaking for moms here, I think you would, you would, yes, you would say that that's the thing that you're the most proud of as you look at your children, the faithful legacy that you've left in their life. And so, so today is Mother's Day, and, and I think as, as a way to honor my mom, as the way to honor moms here, I think let's do that. Let's talk about Jesus this morning. Because, yes, um, moms, we, we thank you. We appreciate you. We, we, you are hardworking women, and we really appreciate that. But I think a humble Christian mom would say, okay, preacher, just, that's enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and you're not excused from getting your wife flowers or cards, okay? Um, thank you, but let's get on to talking about Jesus, right? Because that's the most important part. Let's talk about Jesus because that's the most important part. That's what we need to do is proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that we can talk about. And so let's do that this morning. Let's talk about Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26 as a parent, if my children, since my children understand this, I, I have a deep uh, sense of, of satisfaction, of, of pride. Good. We still have a long road ahead of us. Our, our kids are, what are they, eight, nine? Eight, nine now? Their birthdays are coming up. We're going to have a 10-year-old. I'm old. I'm older than 31. Jeremiah is so young. He's got all that hair. Good-looking guy. Nevertheless, okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, we've been talking about communion for a couple weeks now. 
and get into what does communion mean? What actually happens? Why are we doing this? Every week, if, you, if this is your first time here worshiping with us, we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, but every week we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And every week we come together and, and we have uh, one of the elders, one of the deacons, somebody comes up and gives a communion meditation, talks about what we're doing. And then we pass the trays and we celebrate the Lord's Supper. A couple weeks ago we talked about the cup that Jesus drank from. And the cup that he drank from was the cup of, of suffering. How he went to the cross for our sins and took our place to make atonement, to reconcile us back to God. And then we talked about how Jesus was the perfect Passover lamb. How he was the perfect sinless sacrifice that took our place and how we remember that when we celebrate communion. And we talked about how communion, here at Defiance Christian Church, we practice open communion. We don't have closed communion, meaning it's reserved only for members. And so if you're worshiping with us today and you, you, you notice that the tray went right by you, and if it missed you, I apologize. That's because the, the deacons were probably... Uh, I don't know. I have no excuse for their horrible behavior, and we'll talk to them after church. Unacceptable. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't on purpose, I'll tell you that. It wasn't on purpose. It could have just been a mistake, and hopefully they didn't. Um, but communion is open. We believe it's the Lord's Supper, and we believe that if, if you uh, have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, and you feel it in your heart to remember what he has done for you, then feel free to partake. Feel free to partake of the, the bread representing his body and the juice representing his blood given for us. But we're going to look at communion, uh, dig into it a little bit more here today uh, to see what it means for us. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul is writing to this church, and this church is really, really struggling. They've got a division between the rich and the poor. They're coming together, and they have a, they have a feast, and then they have communion and, and, and the Lord's Supper. And it's not going well. There's some division. There's some fighting, some arguing, and Paul is clearing it up. He's saying, listen, church, if he had a pool noodle, he would have been whacking people with it, okay? I'm sure he would have been pretty upset. Um, verse 23, chapter 11, verse 23, clearing up some, some, some bad behavior here. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. This is the pattern. This is what we want you to do. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so every time we come together, we, we do a couple things when we celebrate communion. We're gonna look at those things this morning. That we, we proclaim Jesus' death in communion. It's our proclamation. That we proclaim Jesus' death in communion. Now we, if you notice, we're missing our projector. Everybody look up there, see? It's, it's gone. So we used to have a projector that shined it in the back, but we don't have any more. There we go. Now we've got it in the back. Good stuff, Rob. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to start a projector fund. No, I'm just kidding. They've got, the ID, IT department has got plenty of, of fundage, so we'll get bonus projectors. We proclaim Jesus' death in communion. We stand up and we say, this is my Savior. Every time we, we, we celebrate communion, we proclaim it, we announce it. Maybe if you have the, the New Living Translation, instead of saying proclaim there, they say they, we announce Jesus' death. And then the King James Version says we shoo, we show we show, uh, the Amplified Version says, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. We're showing the world what Jesus did for us. As a united body of believers, if you partake in communion, all of us at this, at, 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 per, periodically through this, we could all do it at once. We could hold it and wait and take it together. But for the most part, we just, whenever you're ready, but we all take the bread and the juice and we proclaim what he did for us. We pro proclaim, we announce that Jesus is the Savior, the perfect sinless lamb who came from heaven and earth to live a perfect life here and die on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to give himself in our place. That while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die on the cross for us. And so all of us come together and we symbolically show that his body and blood was given for us. We proclaim it. And as I think about that, that proclamation, it's a powerful object lesson. When we celebrate communion, it's a powerful object lesson. How many of you learn very well from lectures? 
See, no one's hands up because no one's paying attention because this is a lecture, okay? And, and it's one guy talking head and you fall asleep. And I do my best, okay, to not let you fall asleep. Uh, but, but typically, you know, uh, the lecture is not the most successful uh, translation of material and information. And so Jesus, in his divine knowledge, he goes, hey, you know what? I'm going to give them a way to remember me. I'm going to give them a way that they can, they can see, that they can taste, that they can smell, that they can physically touch an, an element, something, something that they can tangibly hold on to. And every Sunday we come together and we participate in an object lesson. And, and we take the, the bread. And I wonder, when you took that, that small little stale, tasteless, nondescript cracker, did you hold it and think of his body? Did you hold it and think of him on the cross as he broke it, as he, as he gave himself for us? And you hold that and you, you eat it. And you take the juice and you think of his blood shed for us. You think, you think of the thorns. We were hiking the other day at a metro park and um, the thorns on some of those trees, I don't know what kind of trees they are, but the thorns, they're just, just gnarly thorns on these trees. And I think those were stuck on his head as he was crucified in the most horrific way. And we take the bread and the juice and, and we remember that his body was given and broken for us and we, and we eat it. And, 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 and we also remember that, that he's inside of us and he lives inside of each and every one of us that calls Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. Not that there's something mystical happening as we put the bread and the juice in us. It's just some remembrance. But we remember what he did. It's a powerful object lesson that we can remember what Jesus Christ did. And so the next time we get the the chance to celebrate communion, I encourage you, sit for a second. Hold that bread. Hold that juice. Let that, let that object lesson remind you of what Jesus Christ did for you. When we take the, the bread and juice, we, we look back and then we look ahead. We look back and we look ahead. First Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 26. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A future action. But Paul is saying, hey, remember, on the night that he was betrayed, look back. Look back. On the night that he was betrayed, this is, this is what's happening. Uh, Paul, is, Paul is repeating uh, what the, I believe the apostles told him of what they saw. We go to Matthew chapter 26, a couple books to the left. Keep, keep a, put a bulletin or something here in 1 Corinthians. Matthew chapter 26. Let's take a trip back there because, because I forget things. I do. I forget things. So, so let's go back in, in history. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26. Let's go back chronologically here. And let's go back to that night when, when, when Jesus was betrayed. We think back to the Holy Week, the, the time when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. Hosanna. Hosanna. He teaches things aren't going incredibly well. And he knows his time is coming on, on Thursday night when he's arrested and Friday. So Thursday, he gathers with his disciples and they celebrate the Passover meal. And after they celebrate the Passover meal, he has them all together there. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus. Where do you want us to go make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Verse 18, go into the city, a certain man will tell, uh, and tell him. The teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. And so they did that. And then uh, verse 21, while they're eating, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Go back in time. Think about that moment as you sit around that table. As one of his disciples. Somebody that, that's been selected by Jesus has been walking with him for years. You've given up everything that you had and you're with Jesus and you're sitting at the table. He says, somebody's going to betray me. I'm pretty sure Peter probably looked around like he's ready to just beat him. Just, just, let's, let's fight now. Let's meet you outside. Passover's done. Move the table. Let's go. I think Peter would have. Maybe if he didn't, I would have if I was there. You're going to betray Jesus? Really? But really, it's all of us. 
At this specific time, it was Judas. Judas gets up and does what he's called to do. Skip down to verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. This has got to be one of those moments where in time you're sitting there as a disciple and you're thinking, what? That's just bread, Jesus. I don't totally get why you're taking that loaf and you're breaking it. This is your body. I, I'm not completely following with you, Jesus, but he gives them his body, the, the bread. Then he took a cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with my father, uh, in my Father's kingdom. And so he says, this is, this is my body given for you. This is, now, he's not literally giving them his body in a form of weird cannibalism, but he's giving them the pattern for a memorial. He's saying, listen, this, this is what I want you to do. I want you to remember my body given for you, my blood poured out for you. I want you to remember that. I want you to do this because I, I really appreciate it. Verse 28, this is my blood of the new covenant, the covenant, which is poured out many for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we come to communion, do we remember that? Do we take a trip back to the, the Last Supper when Jesus was with his disciples and he broke the bread and he gave them the cup? And he said, this is for the forgiveness of sins. Not the bread and juice, but his body. Him as a sacrifice is for the forgiveness of sins. Of sins. And so when we hold the bread and the juice, do we remember? There's nothing we could have done to get our sins washed away. There's nothing. We could try hard. We do whatever we want. But we can't get rid of our sin. It's only through the power of the blood of Christ. We're talking in our DCC What We Believe class this morning. We're talking about the fact that one day Christ will return and he'll judge both the living and the dead. And I asked the class, I said, so what are you going to say? Oh, <laughs> somebody said, oh, nobody likes to be in that place. Nobody wants to be on the chopping block. And I said, yeah, this is like the worst reality television show ever. You're fired. I don't want to hear that. What do we want Jesus to say? What are we going to say? What are we going to say? Are we going to plead? Are we going to beg? What are we going to say? I appreciated someone's answer. I said, I'll claim the blood of Christ. I said, I said that's it. That's what you say. You show up and you stand in front of Christ and you say, I was with you. I, you're my savior. You're the one who, who made atonement, who reconciled me back to God. You're the one who went to the cross to take away my sins. You're the one, verse 28, you're the one which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You're the one who offered forgiveness for sins and I called on your name. So uh, what do I say when I get to heaven? I say that you're my savior. And I think Jesus' response biblically will be welcome, well done, good and faithful servant. And so when we take communion, we look back at what he did and we look ahead of the time when he'll come back. He'll come back and he'll look at us and say, well, what is it? Was I the Lord of your life? Or were you just too busy? Was I your savior? Or was I just uh, a fairy tale? A made-up story to help you get through hard times. He's the savior of my life. And so when I stand before him, I'll humbly say, boldly, but humbly say, you're the savior of my life. Welcome home. And so we look back and we look ahead and we continue to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. First Corinthians, back to First Corinthians chapter 11. When we, Paul's saying to the church, hey, remember, you guys are messing up the Lord's Supper so bad. Remember uh, that I, I receive what I pass on for you. I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. The night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, Paul is saying, remember, this is, this is what Jesus said and did on the night he was betrayed. And so when we celebrate communion, we remember and we look past, we look backwards, but we also look ahead to when he returns, when he takes us home, when we get to spend eternity with our Heavenly Father in heaven. That's, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. That's the time that I'm looking for. So we look back and we look ahead. We also proclaim, we continue to proclaim his death until he comes. 
We continue to proclaim his death until he comes. We, we here at Defiance Christian Church, if you're visiting with us, um, first time, we celebrate the Lord's Supper each and every Sunday. Each and every Sunday, 52 Sundays out of the year. Unless it's a weird year and there's only 51 or there's 53. We're going to celebrate it every single Sunday of the year. And you may think, well, well, why do you do that? Why do you celebrate communion every single Sunday? Because not every church does it this way. A couple things. If you've got your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 should be a couple pages to the left. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is a, a, a Christian church, and it's part of the Restoration Movement Christian Church. Okay? And, and it's not actually, we don't, um, I say that word a lot, but we don't call ourselves a Restoration Movement Christian Church. We just call ourselves a Christian church. And the reason we call ourselves a Christian church is because we wanted to restore, we want to do the best we can of restoring Christianity to look like what it looked like in the Bible. Okay, and so if we have a timeline, we have a biblical timeline. So, so Jesus establishes the church, and the church is doing pretty good, but it gets distracted and polluted with man-made opinions. And I think we shouldn't have guitars, and I think the chairs and wooden pews that hurt your bottom to sit on them, and that's what we should have. And and then somebody comes along and says, "That's just silliness. Let's get back to the back, bring it back up." And so the church continues, and then it gets distracted again. And then the reformers come, and they bring it back up. And they say, oh, let's get back to what it looks like. And so the church has always existed. The gates of hell can't prevail over it. That's Matthew 16. It's always existed. Come around 1800, somewhere in there. There's a couple guys that, that got together and said, listen, let's just drop all this man-made stuff, and let's just restore New Testament Christianity. Let's just get as close to it as we can. One of the man-made practices that we looked at last week was closed communion was communion tokens, that you had to answer the right questions, that you had to be a member of good standing, and if you're a member of good standing and you answer the questions, then you receive the communion token, and you would present that communion token the next Sunday, and you would receive the Lord's Supper. If you didn't have a communion token, you didn't get to take communion. That's not in the Bible, but that's a man-made doctrine that they put in there, and it was pretty authoritative. So, so no, 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 let's not do that. Let's get as close to we can as, as what the scriptures say. Let's do as, as much, as close to this as we can. So, so we have to read, uh, what, what did the apostles devote themselves to? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So, so the apostles' teaching, so reading from the scriptures, so, so doing that. Um, and now, if you remember, they don't yet have the Bible. And so the apostles are actually the ones touring around and It'd be kind of cool. Today's guest speaker is Peter. I mean, actually, like Peter. Not, not today, but that would be kind of cool to be uh, part of that church back then. The apostles teaching to fellowship, to getting together, to caring for one another. The breaking of bread and being a praying church. That's what they devoted themselves to. So if the, the New Testament church, if they devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper... Well, then it's going to be something that we're going to devote ourselves to. We're going to make it a priority in our worship services. We're going to put it as the center point. Get you ready with some songs. Get your heart focused. Remember what Jesus did. Oh, it's important. And go right into the Word. So we're devoted to it. We also see this pattern show up in Acts chapter 20. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. The book of Acts is, is church history. This is when the Holy Spirit comes and the church is emerging onto the scene. And it's this transitional period between Old Testament law, Jesus is here doing his thing through the Gospels, and then Jesus leaves and he says, here's the reins, guys, take over the, the, the message, share it with the world. And the church explodes onto the scene and it's kind of a rocky start and it's getting going. Uh, but in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we see Paul getting ready to preach a long sermon. He actually makes this guy fall asleep, or the guy just fell asleep, and he falls from the third-story window and dies. Uh, he comes back to life. They did a miracle, so it was good. But that's a pretty long sermon. Chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Wait, 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 wait. On the first day of the week, they came together to have a board meeting? No. On the first day of the week, they came together to sing songs? No. On the first day of the week, they came together to hear really good preaching. No. It sounds like the priority of the early church was to get together to do what? To break bread. So on the first day of the week, you may think, oh, wait, wait, first day of the week. I thought Old Testament was Sabbath, and Sabbath was on Saturday. You're right. 
Okay, Sabbath was on Saturday. But when did Jesus come back to life? Oh, he came back to life on Sunday. Oh, so there was a little change there, a little bonus thing there. So that's why we do church on Sunday, isn't it? I, I think it is. The first day of the week? Well, they met on the first day of the week, so we're going to meet on the first day of the week. What's significant about the first day of the week? That's when he came back from life, so let's do something cool on Sunday to remember that he came back from life, from the life, from, from the grave. And what's the significant thing that they did each week? First day of the week, we came together to break bread. It was good enough for them. That's what their focus was. That's what their priority was. That's the pattern that will follow. Now listen, I said it's a pattern. This is not a biblical command that you can't do communion bi-weekly. You can't do communion monthly. You can't do it every six months. But it seems that the pattern of the early church was to do it weekly. It was something they devoted themselves to. It was something that they focused on. So we're going to do it like they did it. We're going to do it on Sunday. We're going to have the Lord's Supper each and every Sunday. And you might be sitting there scratching your head thinking, wow, that's a lot of reminders so we don't forget about Jesus. He must be really important. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And so that's why we do this the first of the month. Excuse me, the first of the, the every, every first of the week. You seem to be paying attention. Now, some churches will say, listen, if you have communion every Sunday, then it just becomes routine. It just becomes routine, and when it becomes routine, it becomes commonplace. When it becomes commonplace, then it doesn't mean anything to you. And, and, and this, okay. The other day, we were at the, uh, the Magic Gives Back show, and so there's the, at the, at the, the Junior High Auditorium. I don't know if that's a junior, the, the, the auditorium in, in downtown Defiance. And uh, after the show was done, there were, all the acts were coming out, and they were signing people's cards. Okay, and so I was out there, and I was with my family, and I stopped to talk to somebody, turned around, and then my family was gone. Poof. I was like, eh, they're with mom and grandma. I'll just sit here and wait for them to come back. I think they went to get somebody else's autograph. But while I'm sitting there, kind of looking around for my family, keep feeling kind of sheepish, I, I see some, somebody I know. I see a parent I know. And she looks at me, and her face is just, it's, it's not normal. I'm like, are you okay? She goes, I can't find my child. So I say, okay, you go that way, I'll go this way. I go, this is a pretty good sized crowd. There are people going all over the place. And so we're looking around, we're looking around. We can't find her, we can't find her. And finally, we both are like the same time. Ah, there she is. She comes on the set and this mom is just like, I'm so glad to see you. And she's just so excited. Because it was lost. She lost her kid. And when, when you find what's lost, it, because it, it was, in, in my family, oh, it's just commonplace. I see my kids every single day. But if I lost them, well, that would be a radically different story. But when we see something every single day and we do something, and I see my kids every day, I see my wife every day, it can become commonplace. Oh, we lose the importance and we forget how valuable our mothers are. And so we have to have Mother's Day to remind us of how valuable our moms are. And if we, if we only did communion once a month, well, it, it seems humble and pious to, to do it less frequently, to make it more special, but it doesn't make sense. It would be like doing this. Let's read the Bible less, so when we read it the few times that we do, it's more important. Let's pray less, so that when we pray the few times that we pray, it, it's more. Hun, Kelly, we're going to talk less, okay? Like maybe once a week, we'll have 15 minutes, okay? And it will just be like the best 15 minutes ever. This is why she usually works with the kids and doesn't come to church. No, no. That's not going to work. Listen, every single Sunday that we come together, I'm going to follow the pattern of the New Testament church. And they came together to break bread. Because I don't want to forget. And at the same time they say I don't want to forget, when I come to the Lord's Supper, I want it to mean something to me. When that mom grabbed her child, that meant something to her. Yes, what was lost has been found. When we, when we take communion, does that go through our mind? I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm saved through Jesus Christ, through his blood. And I remember this. So we're going to follow the pattern of the early church and celebrate communion each week. Last thing, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. 
When we pass the trays, it's just bread and drink. Whether it's wine, grape juice, Gatorade, Juicy Juice, Splenda, I don't know what you guys put in those cups. Sometimes it tastes weird. But nevertheless, okay? <laughs> cranberry juice was on sale, so we're going cran Really? Can we do that? I don't know. Let's, let's try to get as close to the New Testament pattern as was. Uh, okay, um, but, but that's why I put drink up there, because you're like, that's a horrible sentence. But I put drink because if it's Gatorade, okay, whatever it is. It's just bread. It's just juice. And then I was going to say it's just a memorial service, but it's not just a memorial service. It's a time where we remember what Jesus Christ did. But a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, have come to believe that it's, it's actually the body and blood of Christ. Taking a very literal translation of John chapter 6, they, the, 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 the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, they believe in, in the doctrine of transubstantiation. If you're playing Scrabble, you will win. Transubstantiation, okay? And, and what happens in transubstantiation? Uh, the consecration of the bread and wine, after it, uh, it, it changes. It changes into the literal body and blood of Christ. And so the priest blesses it, and it literally changes. Now it's still chemically, scientifically, it's still just wine and bread, but something spiritually happens as per their belief to it. As I was studying this doctrine, and I'm thinking to myself, I, I don't think that's biblically correct. I think when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you, I think he literally had a loaf of bread in his hands and gave them bread. I think he, when he said, this is the cup in the new covenant, drink it. I don't think he meant the cup. Get it? I don't think he meant the cup. I don't think he meant his blood. I think he meant the wine. Or, the, or, the, or the, the grape juice, we could talk about that later. There's some who suggest, and I think so, that it's unleavened, so it's not alcoholic. It's just grape juice, which they could make. We could discuss that later. We will, if you'd like to. But whatever it is, bread or juice, it's still just bread or juice. And so some churches will, will, will teach that it's, it's transubstantiated. It's, it's changed. It's, it's turned into the literal body and blood of Christ. The Council of Trent, 1545 around there. Um, still the same texture, shape, and taste, but Christ is fully present within the particles of the host. I, I don't think that happens. I don't think it does. Actually, I, I really struggle with, with giving a, a man the power to, to pray a blessing over bread and juice and turn it into literally Christ's body and blood. I don't think that can happen. There are a lot of things in the Catholic Church that we agree on, that we, that we agree on, but this one I have to look at and say, I don't, this, this, Jesus is speaking metaphorically here, okay? He's not speaking literally here. Um, also in the, in the practice of transubstantiation, that there's a sacrificial act associated with it, that there's a, there's a real sacrifice, again, offered by Christ. Another source I was, I was reading to describe this as, as that there's forgiveness of sins in participating in the Lord's Supper, and I, I'm thinking, by, by eating and drinking this, I'm forgiven of my sins? I thought the Bible said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us. And I thought forgiveness was, a, was a, a, a one and done, that we are regenerated at the point of conversion. And that when I come to Christ and call him as Lord of my life and I'm baptized, I'm forgiven of my sins and filled with the Holy Spirit. Past, present, and future, Done. And I don't need a continual re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's what this is saying. And so transubstantiation, I have to reject that. Consubstantiation, Lutheran churches do this. Consubstantiation, uh, some, not all, but that the, uh, the, the, the spiritual presence in, with, and under the elements. It, listen, um, it's just bread and juice, okay? And the only thing that changes in communion is my heart. Let me say it again. The only thing that changes in communion is my heart because we looked at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. When I come to communion time, I hold the body and, 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 the, and excuse me, the bread and the, and the juice and I examine myself. And the thing that changes in communion is me. 
It's not this stale bread and this juicy juice changing into Jesus. It's not. It's me. I reflect on what he's done for me and how much love I have for him. And I make a change in my heart. And so transubstantiation, I, I, have, to, I have to reject that. Because I, Jesus, I see him speak very frequently in metaphors. In the book of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. Is Jesus a vine? No, 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 no. I am the good shepherd. I thought he was a carpenter. I, th I thought he was. I am the door. Je Jesus is in a door, okay? And so when he, when he metaphorically speaks to his disciples and says, this is my body and my blood, it's not literally his body and his blood that we're taking and consuming. It's just a, it's just, I don't want to say that. It's simply, I don't even want to say that. It's an incredibly significant memorial service. Symbolically reminding us of who Jesus Christ is. Let me read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 again. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. May we never forget what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. May we never forget the most important lesson our moms ever taught us. And I pray that you were blessed with a, with a godly mom. I pray that one day, young ladies, you could become a godly mom who passes faith on to your children. For those of us who've had godly mothers and fathers, thank them after, after worship for the difference that they made. While we're still here, each Sunday, we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper to remind us of what he did on the cross. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you for your son who lived a sinless life and gave himself for us. And we are going to talk about that every single day. We're going to remember that every single day because it's the most important thing that's ever happened in my life in our lives. God, we thank you so much that you love us and that you extend that gift of salvation to all. That it's free. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you need to make that decision to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, I encourage you, please, please do so today. What a, what a great way to send your mom uh, a, a text message. Hey mom, made the decision to follow Christ today. Hey mom, made the decision to recommit my life. I've, I haven't been doing what I'm supposed to be doing, okay? I've been a little distracted, but I'm back on track. If your mom was like my mom, she would be ecstatic. If that godly grandmother that's always been talking to you about Jesus, invested in you, if you called her up and told her that, I'm pretty sure she'd be excited. Make the decision to write yourself with God through the power of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing our song of invitation.